here we go again with a Latin root that has Greek roots, a Greek root that it's derived from. Allos in ancient Greek means other, one of the ways of saying other. And then alius and alter are related to it. And um, all and alt tend to be the forms that are used most often. It occurred to me to do, you know, alteration when you see a quite often maybe cleaners or something, and it says we also do alterations. That's idiomatic. You know, no, no, um, <clears throat> no Mar Martian would be able to guess that there's a kind of niche meaning for the word alteration to the extent to where um, it's listed, you know, the, the, to, where, to the extent to where a cleaner, if they put in their window, we do alterations, they know that you know what that means. Okay, so that's idiomatic. How do they know that? They know it because it's the way the word's used. But just by looking at the etymology, you wouldn't know it. Okay, why? I-O-N is state of or being. Okay, being what? Being made, alterate. Eight, in this case, does mean make, do or make. And then the alter or alt means other. Um, so it's the state of making something other than what it is. And why would that happen to mean making changes to clothes, tailoring them, right? Why would it mean that? It just does. Okay, that's an idiomatic, an example of an idiomatic meaning of a word. It comes to have currency, or common currency, as meaning one thing rather than whatever. Why doesn't alteration mean changing the stitching on a baseball? Okay, in an alternate universe where baseball was, you know, mattered um, more than anything else, then you would, you know, like, you know the, the cliche of uh, the different ways of saying snow um, for Eskimos, that's, that's kind of what I'm talking about here. Um, so I guess we live in a society where clothes are important. You know? um, so when you see the word meaning to make a change, um, you think of clothes being changed as opposed to what? You know, psychologically, if you change your mental state, that's a psychologist, and that kind of is an alterer of a mental um, uh, condition. But uh, as far as physical things, it, it's uh, reserved for, for this meaning. <clears throat> so to alter something is to make it other. Another way of saying that would be to change. It's usually um, compared to or seen as a synonym, seen to be a synonym with uh, change, right? Which is simply because it turns one thing into another or something into a different state. Okay, when you alternate, you go back and forth between one thing and another, but it's not only one thing and the other. It could be many different things, and that's why I like this illustration. So you're jumping from the blue to the red to the yellow to another yellow to the red to the blue to another blue. It doesn't matter. The fact is that you're alternating. You're making other, right? You're making something other, be other. Making something be other by alternating between one thing and another and another and another. It doesn't have to just be two. And if you choose an alternative over another alternative, uh, the if, as you guys know, um, as an adjectival suffix, means um, state of or being. And the idea of alternative music, especially in the early 90s when you're talking about Nirvana, I mean, everybody was using that, you know, the grunge scene, et cetera, was, was considered alternative because it was other than the mainstream, obviously. <clears throat> All right. So there's... Um, a guy that you've probably read, at least in high school, if not earlier, probably high school. Um, I'm guessing certainly college. You read 1984, at least, uh, somewhere along the line, or Animal Farm, or both. Um, and so his alias is George Orwell. That means it's his other name. It's the other way of referring to him, as it says there, a false or assumed identity. Okay, And um, his real name, his given name, uh, was was uh, um, Eric Blair, okay? So that's an alias. And along those same lines, you have a, another way of using that root that means other. In this case, you're not talking about a person, you're talking about a place. It is a place that you say you were instead of the place that someone's trying to peg you down as having been at, right? So were, were you the day of that, you know, it's that stuff. So what was your, what is your alibi, okay? In Latin, alibi literally means other place, other place. Alibi is an adverb, meaning an other place, okay? So yesterday, uh, no, today Joe is at home. Yesterday he was alibi, 
okay, in Latin. That's what it would be, in another place, somewhere other than home, okay? So it literally comes from that. All right, now this is a weird word, um, how it's been used. Um, this idea, and it goes all the way back to ancient Greece at least, this idea of others than natives, okay? Don't forget what native means. We got that from the very beginning. It means born or naturalized, made as though you were born in a country. What's the alternative? An alien, an alien, okay? That means another. And that goes all the way back to ancient Greece, this idea, if you ain't one of us, you're one of them. And if you're one of them, you are, in our terms, an alien. And look what they make movies about, the, the, you know, th that's an alien, okay? You get my, you were talking about kind of interesting uh, superimposition of, of imagery here, okay? Um, you're an other, you're not one of us. You're, you're one of those other creatures, okay? Well, that goes all the way back to the ancient Greek conception of an alien. Guess what the word for alien or other in, or at least one of them, one of them is xenos, and from which the word xenophobia comes. Okay, that's Greek. But then there's another one. Anybody um, know uh, what someone who was from someone not in Greece was called by the Greeks? Starts with a B, yeah. Yes, barbaros, barbaroi in the plural, barbarian. Barbarian was the name that was given to someone other than a Greek. And yes, it had a pejorative meaning. The most common, at least folk etymology for it is that, and I think I told you guys this in a different connection, I forget what the connection was, but um, that, that the idea was that the Greeks, when they heard someone speaking in a language other than Greek, you know, very patronizingly and very chauvinistically, um, would, would say, ha, 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 they sound like they're, say, they're just grunting. They're going, ba, 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 bar, ba, bar, ba, bar, barbar, Ian. Ian just means one, just like musician, barbar, bar, right? So one who goes, ba, ba. That's what a barbarian is. That's what an other is. So, so whether you're being other, proving your otherness by means of speaking differently than those who speak the way you need to speak in order to be considered a native or a naturalized citizen, one from the kiwis, one from the community that you live in. That's one way, and then the other way is to straight out, at least it's honest, say you're an other. And that's where that comes from, all right? So words are powerful. That's all I will say. <clears throat> okay, there's Gaga, what the hell? Give her some kudos for her various alter egos. And that's what that means, okay? In Latin, literally, alter means other, as you know, and ego means I. These are different I's, not E-Y-E, -E, the letter I, the one that means you and me when we're speaking about ourselves in the nominative case. I go to the store. Ego, A-O, ad, whatever, whatever, tab, tawernum, okay? I go to the store, I, okay? So an alter ego is a different I, a different, in effect, personality, identity, Interestingly, identity um, comes from the word meaning it. Okay, so the part of yourself that you identify with, part of your psyche. Um, and then altruism, using the same root, the alt comes from alter, as you see at the top of the slide, alter, and the T uh, and, and the R are reversed, big deal, okay? In that case, to make it easier to say altruism than all retreatism, however you say that. Um, all or Altruism, or altruism, altruism. Okay, so it's easier to say altruism. Get rid of the e. That's all. What's going on there? So what is altruism? That's just doing things for others, right? Okay, it's the practice of putting others in front of yourself, at least in some cases. Um, simple, common word. Good to know where it comes from, and not surprising, right? Even a Martian uh, could guess this one. All right, this is maybe my favorite of this, from this route, mainly because I have allergies, uh, hay fever. What is an allergy? Allergy, all means other. Okay, now this comes from allos, the Greek allos, not the Latin allos. Isn't that sweet? Okay, it doesn't come from allus, it comes from allos. And so what's going on with the ergi? Allergy, the Y means being or state of. Erg comes from a root meaning work in ancient Greek, okay? Erg, ergonomics, how things work, 
right? The, literally, the arrangement of the working of something. So it just means something working from outside of you, other, the other worker, the worker outside of you, something working on you that is foreign to you, that is other, that is alien to you, outside of you, that impinges on your system, right? And I, I remember learning that in anatomy class. I was blown away by it. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? So it, it, it's, it's pointing to the fact that allergens, and, and we all know what the end me, ends means, state of, being, isn't that neat? Allergen, you'll never forget that. Okay, so allergens are, are the, the, the being of working against you, um, working a, a, against your system, and then that's why you take Benadryl or whatever, if you do, um, that, that kind of um, neutralizes the effects of, of the Ex, the the um, foreign force working on, on your system. Allegory, very, very interesting, very important. The why is just state of or being. And the um, egor is really agor, and that comes from a verb in Greek because it's the same um, alos as with allergy. So these are both Greek at the very end here. Um, and, and this, this um, ag or means originally marketplace, and then by extension, speaking in the marketplace. So it means public speaking, kind of like what I'm doing with you guys right now, okay? Even though we're not exchanging goods or anything, the idea is speaking in public, okay? So, so that's what's going on. So, so speaking in public, and then more generally, just simply saying things, saying things, other. Other saying, saying things other than what? Than what they really are on a literal level. That's what allegory is. Now, if you get this concept, you'll never forget this, and this is really an important um, thing to learn. So, Gulliver's how, how many of you guys have, have read either Gulliver's Travels or Animal Farm? One or the other, please. Okay. That side went to better schools. <laughs> I'm kidding. It, it changes every day, so it's not like me. No, I mean, almost every, that was weird. Not as many people over here and way many people. Is there a weird thing on the right side of the room thing? I don't know. Okay, I'm not going to take that any further. But anyway, here. Um, what is an allegory? An allegory is a story that tells things other than what they really are on a literal level. So in the, in the, for, in the case of Animal Farm, you're dealing with a farm that has, um, and if you saw Babe, you almost get a sense of what we're talking about here in some ways. Um, but really, um, the idea is that there are kind of, there's a kind of microcosmic polis or city-state that the animals think of themselves as living on in the animal farm or on the animal farm. And slowly but surely they come up with their own, uh, without the knowledge of the people um, who run the ranch um, or the farm, um, their own kind of system of running things. And at first it's egalitarian, at first it's equal. And then, you know, things occur to where finally um, Napoleon, very symbolically, Name. He kind of takes over and, and they come up with new rules to exclude some of the, um, in this case, pigs who proclaim themselves to be the most uh, important and powerful of the animals on the farm. And bottom line, it just gets out of hand. And that's an allegory by Orwell, who we looked at earlier in connection with Alias, um, about, in his opinion, the way certain governments, and I won't even get political about which ones you look it up, um, happen to uh, um, go um, by, by being corrupted, okay, and when power corrupts and all that. And Gulliver's Travels is a little different. It's modeled on Homer's Odyssey, the idea of the protagonist traveling all over the world and encountering different things, only in this, and also um, Heracles, you know, Heracles' labors, it's patterned on as well. But in this case, instead of being a hero in the traditional sense and overcoming various um, obstacles and killing a bunch of monsters and this and that, um, he encounters a bunch of different kind of people from whom he learns, if you pull back and look and, draw, and, and knock down the fourth wall, um, he learns pretty much what Swift has learned in the real world as an aware person, as a, as a woke person, as we say these days, um, a, 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 a subtle observer of human nature, all kinds of nasty, brutish, undesirable aspects of human beings in each of these different characters that he encounters throughout the world. Um, so like the Odyssey, 
you know, it does the same thing. When, when Odysseus goes all over the world in order to get back home after the Trojan War, he encounters, for example, the Cyclopes, who live exactly the opposite um, to the way that Odysseus and his men characterize the way they live, that is, as civilized citizens of, a, of a, at least a, um, you know, the beginnings of a polis, of, of a city-state. Um, so so there's, there's even allegory going on in Homer's Odyssey as well. Um, but that's the bottom line. You're saying something different than what is literally there in order to get across messages that if you, especially in the past, not as much in our time, at least in the US, but if you were to um, say straight out what you thought um, the, the story meant, in the case of Orwell especially, um, then, then you might get in big trouble, all right? So, so it's, it's partially a, a pragmatic reason for doing it, and, uh, and then there's also the artistic aspects. Now we go on to another very important one from Latin. Sequor means I follow, and the R at the end, don't worry about it. It's different than most of the, you know, it usually ends in an O, but there's a reason for it that unless you take Latin, it's not really important to you, I guess. And then Secutus is having followed. But I'll give you a hint. There's a reason why Secutus doesn't mean having been followed, but rather having followed. And that's what the R is all about. In other words, there's a passive form to this verb that has an active meaning. And that happens sometimes, it's called a deponent verb. Um, that's all I'll say about it. Footnote there, for those who care. Okay, so sequa and secut. And that's why secut looks so different from the sequor. It's just a different form, as we're so used to now, of, of, the, of the verb. Alrighty. Okay, now this is kind of cool. And I bet you don't, man, eh, I bet a lot of you don't know this. There is a very important difference between consecutive and the next word we're going to learn. And they both come from exactly the same root, with the difference being that one word comes from one form of the root and the other from the other form. And as we've learned many times so far, it's almost arbitrary which is which. Okay, so the, the word consecutive and the various words that come from it might as well be interchangeable in, on a purely etymological level from consequent. Okay, so consequent we don't use the adjective consequent very often. But we do use the word consequence or consequences a lot more often than consequent. Um, consecutive, try to make that into a noun. Consecutiveness, whoever says that, nobody. Okay, so it just so happens that when you're dealing with consecutive, you almost always use it in um, either the adjective as consecutive or the adverb consecutively, right? And then with consequent, you usually use it as its noun. <clears throat> or, or, or it's ad adverb, consequently. Mm -hmm. So what's the difference? They both incorporate cone, which is really cum in Latin, meaning with or together. With or together. And then um, the iv, let's just get rid of. The iv and the ent are both um, forms of um, being or to be or state of. So the sec and the sequa. sequa right? Those are the two. Look at the top left of the slide. Sequa and secu, two different ways of saying, using the same root, although the difference just happens to be, and there's absolutely no linguistic reason for one meaning this and the other meaning the other thing. Consecutive means following one after another without interruption and, and in order with nothing else in between. It has nothing to do with cause, with causality, okay? So those billiard balls down at the bottom of the slide are consecutive, but they're following, the way they follow each other, the balls themselves I'm talking about, not the, the numbers, that's a whole other story, but the balls themselves, it, it, they are consecutive, but not necessarily um, consequent uh, to each other. In other words, there's not necessarily a reason why the three ball is placed after the two, other than the fact that it's conforming to counting. But it doesn't have to, right? You might as well put the three after the five, or whatever, okay? Um, and so there's no reason whatsoever for lining them up according to their, to, to their um, numeration. It's just something that you feel like doing, okay? Consequent, on the other hand, when something is consequent, that which follows as a natural effect, result, or conclusion. So now we're talking about causation. The oil company tried to prevent an oil spill and the consequent damage that it would have, uh, that it would have to wildlife. 
the damage that follows upon because of the cause of the other thing. That's different than following simply because it follows. Okay? So consecutive is following just because it follows without any mention of um, causality whatsoever and consequent or consequentiality or consequential or consequently, or any of those words, consequence, all those words deal with um, a causal reason for one thing following another thing. Now that's a big deal. Any philosophy majors in here know that that, that, that has some resonance with uh, Hume in his uh, explorations of causality and his try, pretty much trying to disprove causality. Um, uh, pretty interesting stuff. So he makes distinctions between these two different things. And in his eyes, um, just because something follows something doesn't mean that it was caused by it. And so that he most famously, at least of English philosophers, makes a big deal out of the difference between these two things. Okay. And, and by the way, why do I have that plant coming out of the soil? Because that's a consequential relationship. Okay. The plant comes from the soil not because it just feels like springing up. It comes up because it uh, apparently there was a seed from which it grows, and that's the cause of it growing. Good enough. Okay, subsequent is another way to use that root, uh, meaning follow. And this is a little weird if you let it be, but don't let it be. It's kind of cool if you let it be. Do let it be. And that is this. After a particular thing has happened, afterwards. So how does, when you say subsequently, which means afterwards, okay, afterwards is German. Germanic, after and words. So afterwards pretty much means subsequently. How does it mean? Follow, so follow li, the state of, you know, adverb, adverbial state of. So um, the state of what? Following under something. Okay, what does under mean? Under means behind. The thing in front of it happens and then it is running up behind it and supporting it if it fits that context, but certainly behind it. Okay, so sub, under, and, and, and so it is something that doesn't go in front of it, uh, that, that it's not followed by um, the thing that happens first, but rather um, it follows the thing that happened first. So it's under in the sense of um, behind and uh, um, happening afterwards. And that's, that's the idea. Okay, so it's a positional notion, but it's connected to temporality. It's con connected to the idea that if something is under something and the thing in front of it or on top of it um, comes first, then obviously the thing under it is going to follow it rather than go in front of it. That's all. All right, so there we go. So consequently means as a result, connected um, through causality, and subsequently means later. Um, and, and when something is consecutive, uh, when things are consecutive, it means that the thing that followed it um, was, uh, occurred subsequent to the first thing. Okay, so get those straight. Get those straight. Important stuff. Big GRE stuff, too. Especially subsequent. Okay, now a non sequitur comes right from Latin. So, that, hey, that was a non sequitur. That means it was something that does not follow from, some, from something else. So, it literally means it does not follow. Okay, the known means does not, actually not. The known means not. And the sequitur means it does follow. Got me? So the known negates that. It's like a minus sign, if you will. Okay, so it does not follow. Okay, people died of cancer before cigarettes were invented. Oh, so smoking doesn't cause cancer. That's a non sequitur. Right? It's an example. <clears throat> Now, we're going to make another distinction between two uses of the root with two different prefixes that are possibly confusingly close to each other in form. And so we're going to get rid of that confusion right now. When you prosecute, or, or, or you know, the um, authorities prosecute somebody, it literally means to follow forward, follow them forward. It means, means they go forward and you follow, prosecute. You lead them forth and you are following behind them. This guy getting handcuffed, the idea being um, that he's, be, he's going to be prosecuted, he's going to be um, led forth and the one um, doing so is behind him, you know, walking behind him, prosecuting forward, going forward, following behind, 
this guy, prosecute. And then you have the word persecute, very close to prosecute in form, but very different in meaning. As opposed to the pro meaning go forward, so to follow forward, follow behind um, someone that you're moving forward. You see how this is elliptical, you're leaving things out. Following behind someone you're moving forward, that's prosecute, okay? Persecute, on the other hand, is different. The, the, um, and forget the ut, all right, that's, that's linguistic through French. Okay, so the, the, the sec means follow, pair, through. Okay, so you're following through. In this case, follow means to go forth, go forward, and the implication is that the one that you're persecuting is in front of you, and that's why you're following them. But not only do you follow them, not only do you follow um, behind them as they go forth, but you, in the, at least figuratively, make contact with them and go through them. And that's to persecute somebody. It's to penetrate their very being. It's to be violent, okay? It's to, it's to go through them, at least figuratively, if not literally, okay? Kind of a horrible word, I mean, given history and stuff. Think about various whatever. Um, people and groups of people who have been persecuted over the ages, and that's what it means, to follow through them. It's another way of saying almost, almost it's, it's one step away from saying to stab them. You know, in ancient um, Greece and Rome, the word for kill was the same word as the word for stab. Why? Because it was the only way you could, you know, that was the most popular, there, was no, there were no guns. You know, there was only stabbing and strangling, you know, but, but mainly stabbing. Interesting. All right, no pictures for this word, okay? Um, but also, by the way, the original meaning, not quite the default meaning, I think the default meaning is the one you thought of right when you saw the word, and that's why it's default, um, to, to execute um, somebody. But the original meaning of execute is to follow out something, okay? so. Did, you know, and do know, you guys, that there is a neutral meaning to the word ex execute. It's used by writers, good writers, to mean to do something, to carry it out, to, to carry it out all the way, okay? So to follow it out. To follow through is how we put it usually. But that would be persecute, wouldn't it? And we never say, I persecuted that task, okay? Because that word is used. That word's used up, and that's why there's a, um, there's a disjunc disjunction between um, the way we represent that phrase in the, on the Germanic side of things, to follow through, and the way we do on the Latin side. Persecute is taken up on the Latin side already. And so we don't say we persecute a task, even though that would be the proper way to do so if you're gonna be consistent with the idea of following through. That's a, maybe the best example of the whole semester of a, disjunction between the German side and the Latin side of saying, quote, the same thing, unquote. A sequence, you guys are big shots, so you already know what ENS means, just like E-N-S, or A-N-S, or A-N-S-E, or any of those ants, ints kind of endings, means being, or state of. State of what? State of following. So how, you know, how can you say that one, three, five, seven, and then, oops, let's see. Oh, I guess we all know it's a nine, right? How the heck did you know that nine is next? You know that nine is next because it comes in sequence. Why does it come in sequence? It's not exactly in numerical order, so how did you know it's in sequence? You're using your mind, you're using your logic um, to know that that comes next because of the relationships between those digits, okay? And that's the idea, they follow each other consistently, so why would you not guess that the next one, insofar as it should conform to predictability based on, on past performance, happen um, the same way? And that's why you would guess it's a nine, and that's why it's a sequence. It's something that follows, okay? It's a, it's a following thing, okay? Being following. Sequel, so Empire Strikes Back, the sequel to uh, Star Wars, the first Star Wars. Back in my day, they called Star Wars Star Wars. Now what do they call it? Number one, right? I mean, number what? Four. It's the movie that follows the first movie. That's what a sequel is, and that's why uh, the root is sec. Okay, so I will only ask you the root for this one if I ask it to you.
And then the last word from Sekwar and, and Sekutus is pursue. And the, reason, the main reason I'm including this is because this is the word that we're bouncing off of from the um, Declaration of Independence. But it's also good to see as an example of how radically different a old French word can be from the Latin original. Um, pursue. Pursue is, um, is, follow, is, is, is to follow forward the per through a process that is too complicated to get into without boring you to tears um, came originally from pro. Okay? But you can guess what's going on. All right? And then the su is through Old French, and that's the same thing as, as the roots we've been looking at, the secutus and the and the um, secor, okay? So forward, to follow forward. For obvious reasons it means that, okay? So pursue your dream, follow forward toward your dream is what it means, okay? When you pursue something.